So today I want to talk about subsystems. And subsystems are really just a way that we have of organizing biochemistry. So let's take a simple example, and I'll use that to explain what I mean about what a subsystem is. So here's a chemical compound. We have an OH, and then we have a beautiful ring structure. Up here, we have CH2OH, and then we have a couple of additional hydroxyl groups, one here and one here. And then we have a special kind of linkage that brings us to another similar kind of ring structure. We have an OH here, we have an OH here, and we have an OH here. And up here we have a CH2OH. So these are, are both pretty similar kinds of ring structures, right? This compound is called lactose. And obviously you know it as a, a primary component of milk. Before bacteria can use lactose, they have to break it down, and specifically they have to degrade this bond right here. And so when they do that, you end up with two separate compounds. So all we're doing is we're just breaking that one bond. So each of the two compounds basically are the same. This one has an OH going up, and and this one has an OH going down. It's the only difference between those two, okay? The compound on the left, this is D-galactose. And the compound on the right, this is D-glucose. Now, once that bond's been broken, the bacteria can use those two different compounds. They prefer to use glucose, but a lot of bacteria can also use galactose too. The enzyme that breaks this bond is called beta-galactosidase. And that's because this is specifically called a beta bond. Now, in E. coli, beta-galactosidase is encoded in an operon which contains four genes. We have a gene called LAC-I, and LAC-I is the repressor that controls the expression of the other genes. And then we have three genes, so LAC-Z, which is the enzyme that actually uh, does this pathway, beta-galactosidase. We have LAC-Y, and LAC-Y is a protein that sits in the membrane of the cell and specifically imports lactose. So if the cell is sensing lactose, if there's lactose around, then LAC-Y will specifically bring that into the cell. And then LAC-A. And LAC-A is what's called a transacetylase. So we have four genes here. We have the repressor. We have the enzyme. We have the permease, and we have the transacetylase. These four genes are what are called the LAC operon, and they were discovered in the 1940s, 1950s by two scientists, Jacob and Monod, and they won the Nobel Prize in 1965 for this work. So the LAC operon contains these four genes, LAC-I, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. Now, that's true in E. coli, but that's also true in many other bacteria. And if we go to another bacterial genome, and we find four genes, and we think, you know what? The second gene here looks a lot like LAC-Z, and the third gene looks a lot like LAC-Y, then we could probably speculate that this is going to be LAC-I, and this is going to be LAC-A. The next genome that we go to, if we see something similar, where we have four genes, and they're arranged somewhat similarly, 
they don't necessarily have to be in the same order because often genes will shuffle in the genome. So maybe in this genome, we have LAC A, LAC Z, and LAC Y with a repressor or some other transcriptional regulator. Then we can say, you know, we know that this is a transcriptional regulator. We know that this is beta-galactosidase. We know that these are the transacetylases, and we know that these are the permeases. So instead of just considering one gene and saying, hey, what does that particular gene do? We can take a look at the whole operon and say, we've got these four genes. Let's just annotate those four genes all in one go. And that's the basis of the subsystems approach. The idea with the subsystems is that we can build a spreadsheet where we have the genes that we know about. So in this case, we would have four genes. And then we would have the genomes. And so, for example, we maybe would build a spreadsheet where we have maybe E. coli. Maybe we have Klebsiella. That's the organism that we've been working on during the course. And maybe we have Enterobacter, another common gut pathogen. And maybe we have Salmonella, also a related gut pathogen. And so what we could do is we could build a spreadsheet where we say, in E. coli, the LACI gene is gene number 361 along the genome. Now, that gene number is completely arbitrary. We just start counting at essentially the first gene in whatever our contig is. But generally, in, in the subsystems, the numbers are sequential. It's not always true. Sometimes we change the numbers, but generally the numbers are sequential. So we would say, Lakai is at 361. When we've done the annotation and built our subsystem, we notice like Z is at 362, like Y is at 363, and like A is at 364. In Klebsiella, we found that these genes were also sequentially numbered, starting at 4,075 through 4,078. Similarly, in Enterobacter, these genes were sequ sequentially numbered, starting at 1583 and going through 1586. However, when we look in Salmonella, we actually don't find the LAC operon. And so we just leave this blank, and we say that Salmonella can't use lactose. In fact, that's one of the differentiating features between E. coli and Salmonella, is that Salmonella can't use lactose, but E. coli can. So we can build this kind of table where we have all of our genes in columns and all of our organisms in the different rows, and we can populate that table with the genes that are performing the functions in those bacteria. Now, the big advantage of using the subsystems, and the reason that subsystems have become so useful, is that you can just build a simple subsystem like this one that only has four, four genes, and then you can go and think about a different area of metabolism and build a subsystem on that. We can keep doing that. So rather than starting in the genome and going one gene by one gene by one gene by one gene by the next gene by the next gene by the next gene, we can say, let's focus on an area of metabolism that we understand really well and accurately and correctly annotate those genes. Once we've done that, we can go look at a different area of the genome and accurately and correctly annotate those genes. And by building up these subsystems, we build up areas of metabolism where we have really robust annotations that we can use time and time again, and we can propagate through our new genomes as we add them.